So Kung Fu Panda is widely considered by many to be one of DreamWorks' big three, alongside Onion Boy and Teethless. And as you may be able to guess from some of the stuff that I talk about and... do? I'm pretty partial to the Dragon Warrior over the other two. And I think that's what makes me love the series as a whole. Besides the fact that I just adore martial arts and Hong Kong cinema in general, none of it really would have worked if the themes weren't so solid in every entry. So even though Kung Fu Panda 4's trailers hit all of the red flag benchmarks of a soft rebooting, badly written follow-up a la all of the Star Wars sequels and pretty much every Marvel thing that they've made post No Way Home, I won't lie, I still wanted to go on another adventure with Poe in the Absentee 5. And for some reason, even though none of the other movies really did a lot with any of the Furious 5, this one felt the need to tell us we're not gonna do anything with them at all. And speaking of telling and not showing, Let's just go ahead and bow in so we can discuss why Kung Fu Panda 4 wasted all of its good ideas. And just a quick heads up, there's pretty much no way to discuss any of this in any meaningful amount of depth without having spoilers. So this is your only warning. 3, 2, 1, Dima. Now the movie itself begins with Poe taking down a manta ray villain, rescuing some kids, and using the Staff of Wisdom to cut the ribbon for the new restaurant his dad's on. Our boy Poe is clearly living it up and having the time of his life as a celebrity slash guardian, and still throwing down with his heavily Jackie Chan slash Sammo Hung inspired choreography. So at least for now, everything seems to hold up with the rest of the franchise. But you know, of course, because our old heroes aren't allowed to enjoy anything these days, Shifu's gotta pull Poe away to tell him that he has to choose a successor right now. Because Poe's gotta step up as the spiritual leader for the Valley of Peace. And I just wanna ask, why does it have to be now? And that's not a joke, guys. That's a real question that is not answered at all in the movie. I was sitting there in the theater trying not to ruin other people's experience because it said to the audience in plain Mandarin, Poe, you have to find a successor now. Without ever telling us, why it has to be now. Like, I get the idea of finding a successor, but why does it have to be this moment? Where is the explanation for this? And you know, I'm gonna go ahead and be that guy. But, uh, Shifu, what's your job if it's not being the spiritual leader or teaching anyone? Because that Kwun that you were raising the five in is looking hella empty these days, Dima. Does the staff make you the spiritual leader? Because I really feel like there should be more to that job. Also, how long has Poe even been the Dragon Warrior? Because it only feels like a couple of years since he's still getting tossed around in every fight. Spoilers. But there's a bigger problem besides the fact that they never actually tell us why this journey needs to happen right this second. Quick, audience at home, why do most people retire from physically active positions? Most of the time, it's because they can't handle the physical strain anymore, whether that's due to age or injury. That's actually how most literal Shifu are made in real life. But we don't see anything like that from Poe, and it's hilarious because I feel like the perfect setup was there for us to see something. Why not have him suffer from a serious injury in the beginning of the film, or maybe have his age and physique catch up to him? Then you wouldn't have to tell us he needs to retire, because you could have shown us instead. And that's like the thesis statement for the whole movie, man. So many good ideas on paper, but you messed up the execution so badly it's almost like you did it on purpose. Alright, well moving on, Shifu gives Poe some advice about finding help from the universe while hammering home that he needs to do things the way Ugwe would have wanted, which I just want to cut in real quick. The entire point of the previous movies was that Poe was not, in fact, supposed to do things the way Ugwe would have. In fact, Master Turtle wanted Poe to find his own Dao in the world. Also, if you enjoyed Shifu finally relaxing a bit over the last two movies, well, they threw that character growth right in the trash. Not only is Shifu really high strung again, but he's also just kind of vindictive as a whole this time, which feels 
really gross considering that this movie is set some amount of time after the third one. But getting back on track, Poe's meditation leads to him catching gender swap Nick Wilde trying to steal some artifacts and right here is going to be a big divisive point for a lot of people. Because this is yet another female heir to a beloved character driven franchise that is automatically good at fighting and street smart and manipulating people and makes the legacy lead character look like a buffoon. But hot take? I think they made the right call this time, and let me explain why. A good heir needs to be a foil to their teacher in some way. Poe was a nobody from a good home who sucked at martial arts, was out of shape, and had a loving father. However, through the power of destiny shenanigans, he found himself not only in the role of protector of the valley, but ostracized by his peers and teacher until he eventually acquired the skills he has now, as well as the respect of his people and home. Through nothing but his toughness, outside-the-box thinking, and kind-hearted direct attitude, despite being an awkward sausage. Jen, meanwhile, was a street urchin who is adopted by the main villainess because she actively tried to rob her. So rather than being chosen by destiny, Jen chose her own and is raised to be a powerful yet fragile thief who solves problems the same way she solves fights. By giving people the run around and wins people over through guile and charm, despite being voiced by an Aquafina. So if you listen to how I describe both characters, Jen is not only a perfect foil and a wonderful idea as Poe's apprentice, but she's actually pretty spot on for DreamWorks, taking a metatrope that people hate and actually making it work. They just forgot one part, and that is mindset. Poe, like Dragon Gong Fu itself, is adaptable and fluid in his attitude. That's actually why he fights the way he does. But Jen, despite leaning hard into the do as I say, follow the evil rules trope, doesn't quite go enough in selling us on the idea that it's because that's what she's been programmed to do, as opposed to just enjoying it, which seems to be the case. But of course, not really, as revealed by the end, because she's actually a good person. The movie really should have gone whole hog on making Jen enjoy the way she was raised. That way there can be a genuine shift instead of a, oh, I know you're a good person deep down. Because while that's a fine trope, it doesn't have the same punch that a lot of other DreamWorks movies do. The other thing I'm going to say about Jen being able to give Poe some of the business is that Poe, for better or worse, isn't allowed to just be cool. Apparently, Poe's cool moments have to be surrounded by two slices of dumbass, and if I'm going to be honest with you, that's probably the one writing pattern I wish they dropped for this entry. Either way, after arresting Jen, Poe receives word that Tai Lung has come back. Oh, my bad. I actually forgot to mention that the opening scene of the movie is actually at this mining location where the main villainess pretends to be Tai Lung and throws some stuff around to scare everyone. You know how all the trailers and advertisements really played up on Tai Lung coming back? Yeah, that was a fucking scam, dude. But we'll get there, because Jin points out that it was actually the chameleon pretending to be Tai Lung and convinces Poe to let her go with him to Juniper City and confront the big bad. So they set off and head to a tavern, because of course they do. And then we get the best action scene in the movie that, when I think back on, really sells me on how much of an opportunity they threw away with the setups they had in place for this flick. So not only does the fight start organically because of Jen's shenanigans and Poe's earnestness, but the two play off of each other great and Poe is seen as a legitimately powerful force, even though for some reason that I'll get to later, nobody knows he's a dragon warrior. I also adore Poe going behind Jen after she loots the bodies and returning the stolen money, and I really love how distinctly different the two of them move. To cap it all off, we end the entire sequence with Poe firing a dragon wave out of the staff, setting up his little teaching moment with Jen that pays off at the end of the movie, and the two set sail for the city. And this seems like the perfect time to bring up the B-plot of the movie. Instead of having the Furious Five or Shifu doing some stuff, we have Poe's dads. While I'm sure the Furious Five or Shifu stuff would have been preferred, I gotta admit that I still love the chemistry between the two. However, it is inarguable that their plotline is by far the weakest out of the franchise's B-stories. And again, that's primarily because the payoff just isn't there. 
despite having all of the setup for something compelling. In fact, I think the one thing they kind of nailed was general character interaction in this movie. A scene between two roles in a story is more than the words being said, it's the general vibe the parts of a scene give off. That's part of why I didn't call the movie bad or anything like that. It's mid, and it's definitely the weakest film of the franchise, but this isn't either of the Trolls 2 we're talking about here. It's still a Kung Fu Panda movie. However, no chemistry in the world can help you if you end up world breaking instead of world building in an incredibly frustrating plot twist. Apparently the Valley of Peace is equivalent to a small town situation because nobody in Big Juniper knows who Po is or what he's done. Even though Shen threatened to conquer all of China, and his parents were the actual emperors. I know they said he was lord of Gongmin city, but the iconography makes it pretty damn clear they're meant to be emperor equivalents. Point is, I feel like all of this was done for the sake of making shitty fish out of water jokes, when actually playing into the negative side of his celebrity status would have been inarguably more compelling. Because again, the theme of this movie is supposed to be about change, right? But I'll tell you one change I didn't see coming. There is a long ass chase scene in this city set to an eastern instrumental cover of Crazy Train and it is to date the only action set piece in Kung Fu Panda that I was actively bored in. It doesn't help that they played the same durian joke twice within three minutes, nor does it help that it was the third time I sat through Crazy Train in that theater. Can we ban Crazy Train from animated movie trailers, please? So regardless, we end up in the Thieves' Den underground, where, of course, nobody knows who Poe is, although one of them recognizes Shifu's name for some reason, and there is this little annoying recurring gag that they constantly misinterpret the advice they get so that they can do more violent stuff later, and it drives me just a little nuts because clearly, this is another one of those situations where the writers put that in just because they thought it'd be a funny gag, as opposed to a character-driven joke. So from here, we get more dad jokes, then see Poe and Jen sneak into the chameleon's base, only to have Poe get trapped and willingly hand over his staff to Jen, who reveals the twist that she was working for the villain the entire time. Who could have seen that coming? Now, you may be wondering, especially if you've already seen the movie, why I'm kind of cruising along here and ignoring the chameleon's other moments, and it's because I wanted to address the chameleon in her entirety right now. Also, the pacing is really fast in this movie. So the setup is that the Chameleon has basically taken over Juniper City's crime syndicate and takes a cut of their total profits for whatever reason. I think we're led to believe she's turning the loot into these special spirit cages that house her captured victims, but regardless, her entire motivation for being evil and wanting to take over everything is because she was apparently so weak and small that no kung fu school would take her in, so she studied sorcery in order to steal Uguay's staff, open the spirit world, and drain the kung fu skills from the legends that reside there, like a Tai Long. I'm choosing to pause for dramatic effect because if you think about that setup for longer than it takes me to finish this sentence, you'll realize two incredibly large, painfully obvious problems with this character motivation. For one, Mantis exists. So the Chameleon knew about Uguay, but somehow didn't know about Mantis, or better yet, about Master Chipmunk, who was enough of a badass that his comically tiny Warhammer is in this movie during Jen's introductory scene. Furthermore, you're led to believe that the Chameleon knows who Shifu is because she and Tai Lung apparently know each other. So you mean to tell me a fuck bug and a rodent could learn kung fu but a chameleon couldn't? Finally, how does Jen know how to fight if you weren't allowed to learn kung fu? How exactly did you train her? And you know what? Th this is just Space Jam. And that sucks, because not only does the setup not make logical sense, but also because, much like Jen not being pushed forward enough, the chameleon is also wasted because of it. The idea that she too is an outcast and similar to Poe, which she blatantly points out to him and the audience, by the way, is a fantastic setup for a compelling dynamic between the two. The thing that kicks me in the nuts the hardest about this is that Poe acknowledges the similarities and points out his current struggles moving on from being Dragon Warrior. And right fuck here is where they could have done something wonderful. So I'll die on the hill that if this movie had been made in the early 2010 era of DreamWorks, then we may have actually had a movie where the hero successfully talks down the villain and I think it would have been wild. 
especially if Jen tried to step up in her master's place. Think about it. If Poe's strength is in his adaptability and compassion, then having him defeat Jen's own master and parental figure with just words is the perfect way to challenge Jen as a character. And I'm not even saying that Jen had to stay the main antagonist either. The chameleon literally brings everyone back, right? So have Shen and Kai try to take over again or something. I don't know. But obviously they don't go down that road and we have to have the chameleon defeat Poe with Jen's help even though the latter instantly regrets it. Such a waste. Poe is saved by his dads just in time, but he ends up getting frustrated at them too for not believing in him. Once again, you probably could have tied that more into the theme of Poe following his own path movie. And he ends up going back to the chameleon for the climax of the film. When he arrives, we get a bridge confrontation between him and Jen, who wants to stop Poe from getting himself killed, and we cue a quick fight in the rain. So this scene is actually really well done, even the choreography. Although, to be fair, it's basically a ripoff of the moment in Kung Fu Panda 1 between Shifu and Tai Long. However, there's just one major issue I have with it, and that's how it feels to the audience. If there was ever gonna be a moment in the franchise where Poe's skill as a kung fu master should be played completely straight, this was it. Our boy gets his ass whooped by Jen here when this should have been the one time Poe completely and utterly dominated somebody. And not in a malevolent or violent way either, but how Tigress did it to him back in Kung Fu Panda 2. And the reason why it all falls apart comes back to literally the exact thing I mentioned not even 30 seconds ago. Theming. The theme of this movie is change and moving on. But the core idea behind Poe as a character is that he does things differently. Even if there is genuinely no well-established reason for Poe to get a replacement right this second, he was slowly warming up to the idea of an apprentice. But the thing that keeps kicking him is people's lack of faith in his decisions. Shifu is perpetually disappointed in him, and his dads are perpetually worried about him. And nobody even knows who he is or what he's done outside of his little circle. And now, his friend, who he believed in, wants him to give up and go home after betraying his trust. I think this should have been Poe's moment to let all of his own teachers know that he has his own path and that Uguay knew it too. He is not the Furious Five, he is not Shifu or Tai Lung or the Master Turtle, he is Poe and that's why he was chosen and that's what hurts the most about this movie. On paper, the chameleon, a character who steals the appearance and skills of others but uses the mental side of martial arts training, is a great antagonistic force that is wasted by a lack of screen time. Jin is simultaneously a great foil and apprentice who is everything Poe isn't, but their chemistry is wasted by using that time on silly gags and quips. Poe's dads and Shifu are in a constant negative thought process with Poe that stems from a lack of confidence in their son slash student's judgment. Even though a character that everyone universally respects does have faith in Poe's judgment. Even Poe's former villains use their time to joke and put him down over being proactive about their own situation. I mean, I can understand Tai Lung dumping on Poe and watching him fail, but you really mean to tell me Kai or Lord Shin wouldn't have been scheming? Get your ass out of here. It's like you had all the puzzle pieces for a clear blue sky and somehow made it overcast. Obviously, Poe moves on to fight a space jammed chameleon while his rogue gallery laughs at him. Meanwhile, Team Dads and Jin recruit the thieves to help raid the big boss's base. And then we get the climactic battle where Jin gets to deliver the final blow using the Staff of Wisdom. While it was sweet that Poe let Jin finish off her teacher, it was still frustrating because everything in front of it felt hollow. Especially the part where the chameleon decides to combine different body parts of all the masters into some kind of eldritch kung fu dragon, and then immediately proceeds to not do any kung fu at all, because of course you guys have no idea how to make a monster like that actually do martial arts. It's so lame, because she has this epic little line about combining all of their skills and then just stomps and flies around for like 30 seconds before immediately turning back to normal. I thought we were finally gonna get a dragon doing kung fu in one of these movies, but nope! And the movie ends exactly how you think it does. Tai Long and the other villains give Poe their respect for stopping the chameleon and take her with them to the spirit world. 
But just as a final fuck you to me, everyone bows to Poe and he doesn't bow back. Come on, movie. You can't have Poe reciprocate the respect he was just given. I know that's super nitpicky, but it's a martial arts thing, guys. That was highly distasteful. So yeah, they go back to the Valley of Peace with a bright, shiny, happy ending. And even though it's annoying that Shifu complains yet again about Poe's choice for an heir, I actually like that Zhen served her jail time before joining Poe in training. As a final gift to the audience, the Furious Five show up to help train in a quick montage where they recreate their famous training bit from the first film. And speaking of the Five, let's address that real quick. I saw a bunch of early reviews complaining about the lack of their presence, but to be fair, they're never really developed in any of these movies, except for Tigress. And that is Kung Fu Panda 4, a movie with all of the right ideas, but just falling short on the execution. To me, this is a perfect mid-tier movie, because it's not like it's completely devoid of good jokes or action or nice character moments, but the complete package just feels lacking, especially by comparison to the rest of the franchise. Obviously, I didn't go into the direction or choreography super in-depth here because that'd be difficult without having the footage directly in front of us to break down, so I'll definitely come back for its own martial arts and media bit. But until next time, what did you think of the movie? Did I miss anything? Apparently they're making a sequel, so what would you want to see in a Kung Fu Panda 5? Feel free to engage down below and hit the like slash sub if you enjoyed the video, but until next time guys, I'm bowing out, and I'm gonna see you all next class.